Good evening. Good evening. This is a special day at Gustavus Adolphus College. As president of this institution, it is my privilege to welcome you to the Lindau Symposium and to greet a presidential colleague, a distinguished scholar, who will give the symposium lecture this evening. The Lindau Symposium is relatively new to Gustavus. In fact, this is the second such symposium that we've had. And we're looking forward now to having an annual symposium that we really can begin a process of, of open dialogue and discussion and, and conversation. The symposium is named for beloved Gustavus alumnus, a member of the class of 1958, Phil Lindau Sr. Phil Lindau had a very successful business and served on the Gustavus Adolphus College Board of Trustees and was chair of that board from 1992 until 1995. Trustee Lindau believed that presenting and discussing intellectual and philosophical differences is critical to any institution pursuing the ideals of a liberal arts education and is a crucial component in preparing college students to be engaged in thoughtful leaders in a civil society. What better than to have this symposium at his alma mater, a place that has had a tradition of civil discourse and an opportunity for students to debate. As a successful business person, he noted that every new generation of employees was less and less able to be appropriate in their dialogue with each other when they were, had ideological differences. Phil always contrasted that experience to his days in college at Gustavus and through his career when there could be heated debates I'm sure in the residence halls and in other places here on this campus and in the offices in his office, surrounding current events, those debates that would take place. Yet the conversation was respectful and did not become hate-filled or polarizing. The endowed Lindau Symposium was a dream of Phil's and support for the symposium continues from his wife, Nancy Lindau, and their children, Phil Jr., Gustavus class of 1984, and Karen, class of 86. The goal of the symposium is to encourage dialogue among the Gustavus community and to promote broad-based intellectual rigor and appreciation of all viewpoints in order to cultivate a campus-wide respect for civil discourse for future generations. The symposium is intended to focus on pressing issues of the day and to provide opportunities for conservative voice to be heard on the Gustavus campus. Thoughtful evaluation of competing worldviews is a critical component of a liberal arts education. Leading students and those involved in campus life to assess the value of ideals and ideas based on merit rather than on prevailing public opinion. The Lindau Endowed Symposium helps us to ensure the free flow of ideas and open dialogue on this campus. It is my pleasure to introduce Mrs. Lindau Nancy and her son and daughter-in-law Phil and Sharon who graduated from Gustavus with Phil in 1984, and her daughter and son-in-law, Karen and Jonah Pikert, who graduated with Karen in 1986. Please join me in thanking them for all they've done, and I ask them to stand so that we can thank them.
good evening on behalf of my mom, Nancy, my brother, Phil, Sharon, my husband, Johan, and I, I just really thank you all for coming. It is a pleasure to see so many of you here. One of the things my dad valued the most was um, and the exchange of ideas. To say that our dinner table could be animated would be an understatement. Uh, he would love the fact that you were here, um, whether your professors made you come or you chose to come, the fact that you are here means that you will hear ideas that you have not been exposed to in the past, um, presented from a new person in a new way, and that's what he envisioned for it to stay this. Um, I just want to share some words with you. Last January, following the shooting of Congresswoman Gabrielle Giffords, President Obama gave a really moving speech about that event and about the discourse in our country. And as I listened to him, I thought about my dad and how he would have approved of these words. So I just want to share a few of them with you. This is a time when our discourse has become so sharply polarized. A time when we are far too eager to lay the blame for all that ails the world at the feet of those who think differently than we do. It is important for us to pause for a moment and make sure that we are talking with, with each other in a way that heals, not wounds. As we discuss ideas, let each of us do so with a good dose of humility. Rather than pointing fingers or assigning blame, let us use this occasion to expand our moral imaginations to listen to each other more carefully, to sharpen our instincts for empathy, and remind ourselves of all the ways our hopes and dreams are bound together. May these deaths, as he was talking about, may these deaths help usher in a more, in a more, in more, excuse me, more civility in our public discourse. Let's remember that it is not a simple lack of civility that caused this tragedy, but rather because only a more civil and honest public discourse can help us face up to our challenges as a nation. My dad was ahead of his time. He died five years ago this month, but we had talked about civil discourse at the dinner table for years and years and years. And I know that was what he wanted for this community and for the students that lived on this campus, that this would be something that you would look forward to and that would be role modeled and nurtured in you as students um, so that when you leave this place, it would be part of who you are as Gustavus graduates. And so with that in mind, I just really thank you for coming and welcome. It is now my pleasure to introduce tonight's guest lecturer, Dr. Dinesh D'Souza, who currently serves as president of the King's College in New York. As many of you know, Michael Novak was scheduled to be our guest tonight for this lecture. But because he recently developed a complication from surgery, he was not able to travel. And we are so thankful that Dr. D'Souza has been able to arrange his schedule in such short order to be here with us. We thank you for that. President D'Souza was born in Mumbai, India, and came to the United States as an exchange student and graduated Phi Beta Kappa from Dartmouth College in 1983. Over the past 25 years, he has been an active writer, scholar, public, intellectual, starting Early in his career, he was considered one of the nation's most articulate spokesmen for a reasoned and thoughtful conservatism. He served as a policy analyst in the Reagan White House and served at the American Enterprise Institute and the Hoover Institute at Stanford University. His first book, Your Liberal Education, in 1991 publicized the phenomenon of political correctness in America's colleges and universities and became a New York Times bestseller for 15 weeks. It's now been listed as one of the most influential books of the 1990s. President D'Souza has published numerous best-selling books, including The End of Racism, The Virtue of Prosperity, Finding Values in an Age, of techno affluence, what's so great about America, letters to a young conservative, and many more. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Dinesh D'Souza to Gustavus.
for the Lindell Symposium. Thank you uh, very much. That was um, quite an introduction. I, uh, I think I might have been the only guy in the room going, more, more, more. <laughs> <laughs> I'm um, delighted to be here. Um, actually, um, happy to um, fill in for Michael Novak, who's been kind of a mentor of mine uh, at the American Enterprise Institute. and. Uh, I think in some ways we'll be developing themes that, that uh, Michael Novak would be pleased to, to see developed. Uh, and I've also gotten uh, today to, to meet and know the Lindau family, uh, a delightful family, and I'm thrilled that they have uh, made it possible uh, for this series to be inaugurated and for me to be, to be part of it. I, um, I'm going to be talking about some um, issues that are quite timely. Um, I suppose in some ways controversial. I also want to make sure we have time for questions and discussion. And uh, so in my opening remarks, I will try to adopt the motto uh, that King Henry VIII used with one of his wives. He said, I won't keep you too long. Um, now, 200, a couple of hundred years ago, uh, the American founders uh, gathered together uh, around a big table in Philadelphia uh, and they put together what they believed was a, a recipe for a new type of society. Uh, they called it uh, the Novus Ordo Seclorum, uh, which means a new order for the ages. But their notion uh, was to have a blueprint for a kind of a community or country that had never existed before. Uh, they believed that they were creating a society based upon a revolutionary understanding of human nature, uh, and they believed that if such a society was started on this blueprint, that over time it would become the most successful and the most powerful uh, and the most prosperous society in the world. And a couple of hundred years later, we see that, in general, they were right. So here we are, America, and we are quite literally on top of the world. We are the world's sole superpower. And yet, America has been the world's sole superpower for only 18 years. Um, America has been a superpower since World War II, but it was not until the Berlin Wall came down and the Soviet Union collapsed that America became the only superpower in the world. And even now, our position at the top of the world seems extremely precarious. It seems that possibly within our lifetime, yours or even mine, or even sooner, America could drop several spots down the totem pole. We could lose that predominant position. And other countries that were only recently uh, also rams can become the new leaders. And this is a very kind of alarming thought at one level because his history tells us that once a country loses that position of being number one, it never regains it. Uh, the Greeks were once on top and then the Romans for a few hundred years. Most recently, the British Empire dominated the world for something like a century. But the sun did eventually set on the British Empire and I don't believe it will ever rise again on it. So if America ceases to be number one, it is very hard to see how we could ever regain that spot. And other countries, leaner and hungrier, appear to be coming up in the world. 
I'm, I'm an immigrant to the United States. I, I grew up in India. I uh, came to the United States at the age of 17 as an exchange student. Uh, what's fascinating to me about America is that when I look at America today, it is simultaneously the most attractive society in the world and, to some people, the most repulsive. Uh, America is simultaneously a magnet for immigrants who come here. More immigrants come to America than go anyplace else. Young people around the world, even now, and even in the Muslim world, are kind of tantalized, fascinated, uh, attracted by America. And yet, at the same time, there are lots of people who, who hate America. And um, some of those people are in Europe. I mean, if even today. I mean, he's been out of office, but if you walk on the Champs-Élysées in Paris and just utter the words, George Bush, 300 Frenchmen will fling their handbags angrily to the ground. Um, you've got, you know, this uh, resistance uh, to America, and, and, and why Bush, by the way, that's just because Texas is kind of like America in italics, um, America squared, so to speak. Um, so, but that's, that's not what I'm going to focus on today. You've got sort of European resistance to America. More seriously, you have people in the Islamic world who hate America. Uh, and some of them are willing to uh, hate America so much that they're willing to uh, blow themselves up to express this hostility. And in one of my books, I said of the guys who did 9-11, not that they loved their life less, but they hated America more. And uh, one question that for many of us has been uh, a puzzle is what is it about America that stimulates or invites or causes this volcano of hostility, which comes, by the way, not just from the rest of the world, some of the most articulate and pungent anti-Americanism is in America. It's homegrown. Uh, I see it a lot. I speak uh, a fair amount on many of America's campuses. And interestingly, on some of our most elite uh, campuses, uh, you find the strongest and most vociferous critics of America. So here we are, America, on the one hand, the source of great attraction and fascination, and on the other hand, the instigator, or at least the cause, uh, of a great deal of hatred and hostility. I want to explore a little bit what's cause, what, what is it about America that inspires these, these simultaneous and yet opposite uh, reactions. Now, Earlier I mentioned that uh, America is on top of the world uh, and that the founders had this idea of a unique type of society. Uh, that idea is called American exceptionalism. Exceptionalism refers to America's uniqueness. But it's kind of worth asking, so what is exceptional about America? Interestingly, President Obama was asked this very question at a press conference, <laughs> does he believe in American exceptionalism, and he said no. He said, well, I don't think America's any more exceptional than, he goes, well, I guess the British think they're exceptional, and the Greeks think they're exceptional, so everybody thinks they're exceptional, and obviously if everyone thinks they're unique, well, no one is. So the question worth asking is, were the founders right that they were doing something new? What, what is new? What is different about America? And I want to try to answer that question in a couple of ways. The first way is to note that America is at the core uh, and an entrepreneurial society, a society devoted, you might say, to the creation of new wealth, and a society devoted to business. Now, this is actually very noteworthy because historically, in every culture, including that of the West, for millennia, the business guy, the entrepreneur, the, the trader, the merchant, 
has been regarded in every known culture as, well, low life scum. <laughs> this is true, by the way, even in Europe, but it is more true if you go to non-Western cultures. I was thumbing through the other day um, the Analects of Confucius. He says, the noble man knows what is virtuous, but the low man knows what is profitable. Um, in India, we have, have had for centuries the, the caste system. Uh, who's at the top of the caste system? The Brahmin, the priest. Who's next? The aristocrats. And below them, the warriors and the soldiers. And down and down you go until one step from the very bottom. At the bottom is the hated untouchable. Right above him, the merchant, the trader. One step from the bottom. The Muslim historian Ibn Khaldun, considered to be the greatest Muslim thinker of the Middle Ages, has a fascinating section in, in his Mukaddima, where he discusses which is a better way to get wealth, trade or looting. And he considers uh, uh, very carefully the merits of both, and he concludes, obviously, it is morally better to acquire wealth by looting. Why? Well, he says trade is inherently effeminate. Trade, is kind of, trade relies on cunning, which is a kind of low thing. You kind of exploit the wants and needs of other people, which is kind of a cheap thing to do. Looting, he says, is very manly. Uh, it's a masculine thing, because after all, if you're going to loot, you've got to meet another guy in open combat, defeat him, and take his stuff. And this, uh, Khaldun says, calls upon the masculine virtue of courage. So, why am I saying all this? I'm just giving you somewhat facetiously, but only half facetiously, this idea that universally uh, the merchant has been reviled. Even in the West. Even by Adam Smith. Adam Smith, the great defender of capitalism, but in the wealth of nations, Adam Smith defends capitalism, he doesn't really defend capitalists. Uh, his view of the businessman is a little bit negative. He says, you leave a bunch of business guys in the room, they're going to fix prices. It's only through the invisible hand of competition that the selfishness of the entrepreneur is sort of directed or channeled to the material welfare of society. So, and even now in Europe, Inherited wealth is seen as better than earned wealth. Why? Because earned wealth requires you to walk over other people in the European view. So if you inherit wealth, you're morally innocent. But if you earn it, think of what the stuff you have to do to get it. So here's what I'm getting at. The, the American founder has accomplished, you might say, a moral revolution. They took this kind of economic, they, they took this kind of social totem pole with the businessman at the bottom and they flipped it so that the businessman, the entrepreneur, who in other societies was seen as the worst kind of a guy, now becomes in America the best kind of a guy, the model guy. Uh, and the society is organized around wealth and trade. In fact, and here I rely on Michael Novak, Michael Novak has pointed out that if you look at the original Constitution and you uh, leave aside for a moment the Bill of Rights, which was added later, the original Constitution only speaks of one right, and that is the right to patents and, and copyrights. And this is a small indication of the central place enjoyed by trade or entrepreneurship in this American society. Now, all of this is very relevant today because this concept of entrepreneurship, I think, is in our era under fierce attack. Now, by the way, this attack isn't just from Obama. And true, when it first came, it was in the mouth of Obama. And, and it wasn't just about spending money or the deficit. I mean, Obama will often go to college campuses and he'll give speeches to young people. And he said stuff like, don't think of going into business. Don't think of going for the brass ring, the egg, the, the corner office, uh, the big uh, bonus at the end of the year. 
He goes, that's ambition. But that's the wrong kind of ambition. You should have a different kind of ambition. Um, so here we have, when I, when I first heard all this, these critiques, if you will, um, of entrepreneurship, I was really puzzled. Because I said to myself, by the way, Obama and I are about the same age. Um, and we were born in the same year. And uh, we've lived through the second half of the 20th century. So I said to myself, wait a minute, we, we had this great debate in the 20th century between capitalism and socialism. Uh, and as far as I know, capitalism won. We've had all these experiments with North Korea and South Korea, even Bill Clinton in the 1990s conceded that the era of big government is over. So we thought we were sort of done with this. And how is it that now, in the 21st century, suddenly, we're having this debate all over again? What's the deal with Obama? Is he like Rip Van Winkle, who's been sleeping through the second half of the 20th century? What's the deal with this guy? And then as I listened to him more carefully, it hit me that the debate now is actually different. It's not the same as the debate in the 1980s and 1990s. It is true that capitalism defeated socialism, but that debate was a debate over efficiency. What kind of system creates wealth better? Today's debate is very different. You might say that capitalism has won the economic debate, but it hasn't won the moral debate. And the critique of capitalism now is not based on efficiency. Nobody says, the problem with Walmart is that their selection is too poor. The problem with Walmart is that their prices are too high. It's the opposite. The problem with Walmart is that prices are too low, driving out competitors. Um, now, so the point is that the new critique of capitalism is a moral critique. And that's why you hear words like greed and selfishness uh, and profiteering and so on. It's an attack on the character of the business guy. And implicitly a celebration of the intrinsic virtue of uh, the government guy, the bureaucrat. Now, I want to come back to this theme in a little bit. But I want in some ways to broaden it by asking this question. If these are some of the things that make America exceptional, this emphasis on entrepreneurship. And by the way, here's something else that makes America exceptional. It's a country that is to a large degree based not on blood or birth, but on attachment to ideas and fidelity to a kind of way of life, the American dream. What does this mean? Well, think of it this way. All of you in this room, you could come to India. You could live there, you could stay a long time, you can take Indian citizenship, but the fact of the matter is, you cannot become Indian. Why not? Because to be Indian, you need two things. Brown skin and Indian parents. There's no other way. And that is true of most countries in the world. One of the reasons that the immigration is such a problem in Europe is that the immigrants are undigestible. There is no way, or no easy way, within the European system to do anything with them. Can, can a Turk become a German? Can an Algerian become a Frenchman? Can a Pakistani become an Englishman? In general, the answer to those questions is seemingly no. But in America, the Irish, the Italians, the Swedes, the Jews, and today, the West Indians, the Koreans, the Pakistanis, they come here and they, sometimes takes time, even two generations, but they become American. It's possible. And that means that America is not a country based on birth or blood. It's based on some attachment to the Constitution, but I think more specifically to an American way of life. You become American by assimilating to that. Now, why do immigrants come to America? Interesting question. 
If you read the immigrant literature, it gives you an answer, but I think it's the wrong answer. It's such a common answer that it seems true. The immigrants come to America for opportunity. They come to America to make money. They come to America to get rich. Now, first of all, <coughs> like a lot of arguments that I think at the end of the day is a little inadequate, this argument does have a molecule of truth, which is that yes, it's true that in America, uh, there is the opportunity to have a pretty good life, even if you are, I want to say, an ordinary guy. Here's what I mean by this. The rich guy is going to do well anywhere in the world. In fact, if you are really rich, like the Lindau's here, <laughs> you might be better off not living in America. Why? Because you can buy stuff with cash abroad that no amount of money can buy you in the United States. And, and what is that? The privilege of aristocracy of being a truly superior human being. That is kind of unavailable in America, even if you're Bill Gates. Imagine the following thought experiment. Bill Gates walks the streets of the Gustavus campus, stopping students at random. He says, okay, I'll give you a hundred bucks if you kiss both my feet. How many students in this room would do it? Um, there are a few economics majors in the back, uh, but by and large, no. Why? Because the general idea is, hey Bill, you know what, you might have more money than me, buddy, but you know, you're not better than me. My point is there is a social egalitarianism in America that um, limits the prerogative of wealth. Now, be that as a may. My point stands, the rich guy is going to be okay no matter where he or she is. A country is sort of judged by what kind of life it's going to offer the ordinary guy, the common man. And this is where America really does excel, because in America, the common man uh, has it remarkably good. Um, I have an acquaintance in Bombay, India, who has been trying to emigrate to the United States. Or I can never seem to get a visa. But finally, I said to the guy, I go, why are you so eager to come to America? He goes, Dinesh, I just want to move to a country where the poor people are fat. <laughs> and so, yes, it is true that there is material abundance in America uh, that stretches across the society. That's true. I think, by the way, there's a misnomer here, because some people will Dinesh, what are you saying? Uh, in Europe, you have a much bigger safety net. Uh, if you need your hip replaced, or if you need uh, free retirement, uh, that's available in Norway, it's available in France. We don't have that kind of a safety net in America. All true. America has a safety net, but not one that's that extensive. So, while European societies offer greater security, what America offers is greater mobility and greater opportunity. So, in other words, if you are a guy starting out at the bottom, you have a better chance to make it in America than you do anywhere else. Even today, if you meet a rich guy in France or Germany, I'll give you a 50-50 bet that he or she comes from a rich family. I'm not saying success stories don't exist, but they are episodic. People notice them, wow. In America, we don't keep count because success stories are so legion. In fact, they occur in the same family. One guy's working for Oracle uh, software, the other guy's, you know, the other brother pumping gas at the local gas station. Same gene pool, same social environment, but end up in very different positions in life. That's normal in America. Now, not very long ago, I um, was thinking to myself, and I asked myself this question, how would my own life have been different if I had never come to America, if I stayed in India? I grew up in a middle-class family, 
<coughs> my dad's an engineer, my mom, a school teacher, housewife. And uh, I grew up without great luxury, but, uh, but not lacking for anything either. And so you were to you say to me, Dinesh, well, materially, is your life in America better? I would say, yes, it is. But it is not a radical difference. My life has changed more in other ways. The truth of the matter is, if I had stayed in India, I would probably have lived all my life in about a 10 mile radius of where I was born. I would have married a girl of my identical uh, social economic and cultural and caste background. I would, without a doubt, have become an engineer like my dad or a doctor like my grandfather. Um, and I would have a whole set of opinions on religion, on politics, on society, on books that could be predicted in advance. And they wouldn't be that different from what my father believed or his father before him. So what am I saying? What I'm saying is that in general, my destiny would to a large degree have been given to me. Not that I would have no choice, but the choice is within confined parameters. By contrast, in coming to America, I discover something rather stunning. I discover almost suddenly that uh, I am the architect of my own destiny. Now, how this happens uh, occurs in a very kind of peculiar way. I mean, I, I end up on the Dartmouth campus, and by the way, Dartmouth, like a lot of the Ivy League colleges, was founded as a Christian institution. In fact, seven of the eight Ivies, not counting only Cornell, were Christian institutions. So what happened? Uh, Dartmouth was founded, by the way, by a Yale uh, <coughs> congregational minister who wanted to go up into New Hampshire and Christianize and educate the Indians. Sometimes I wonder how I got there. I I think I may have misread the catalog, <laughs> the part about the Indians. Um, but today, those colleges are completely secular, and in fact, somewhat, uh, you might say, aggressively so. Uh, when I was a freshman, uh, we had a kind of convocation week. And I remember, to this day, our uh, college chaplain, a fellow named Warner Trainum, stands up, looks at the thousand students out there, and he goes, look to the left of you, look to the right of you. One of the three of you will have a homosexual experience before you graduate. Now, you have to remember, here's a kid from India. I'm like, wow. I mean, I look to the left of me, I look to the right of me. I said, I better make sure I don't see these two guys for the next four years. <laughs> But, but the point I'm getting at here is from my college days on, I realized that in America, you can make a completely different life than your parents could have imagined. In fact, in America, that's how it works. If, you're, if your parents say to you, hey, young Jane, young Billy, what are you going to do with your life? You know, they can advise you. But ultimately, it is you and not they who will supply the answer to that question. So, the point I'm getting at is that in America, your destiny isn't given to you, uh, it is constructed by you. And so, the core idea of America to me is not the idea of wealth or even opportunity. It is, <coughs> it is the idea of the self-directed life. That is at the core of the American dream, the idea of a life in which we are in the driver's seat of our own future. Now, by the way, I think this is why the American idea is irresistibly appealing to young people everywhere in the world. Why? Because if you say to young people anywhere, in India, in Rio de Janeiro, in the Muslim world, you have two choices. Someone else can tell you how to live your life, or you decide for yourself. I think there's really no contest in how the young anywhere would choose. 
So this is the great appeal of America. The idea of the a life in which we are the framers of our own destiny. And yet, this same America, so attractive to immigrants, so attractive to young people, is also to some people horrifying. This is an America that many people oppose. Now, when I talk about anti-Americanism, by the way, I'm not talking about it as if it's some form of treason. I just mean anti-Americanism as a critique of America. And if you look at anti-Americanism, it breaks into two camps. There are some people who don't like what America is, and there are some people who don't like what America does. The people who don't like what America does are namely the critics of American foreign policy. And these guys say, we don't have a problem with America. We just have a problem with the way America behaves. We have a problem with how America acts in the world. <laughs> America is greedy, it's imperialistic, it invades other countries, it aggressively pursues its own interests, and it leaves the rest of the world in a miserable shape. So I want to begin by saying a few words about American foreign policy, and then I want to consider a deeper critique of America, which is coming, I believe, mainly from the Muslim world, uh, a critique that is a profound critique, not just of what America does, but a critique of who and what America is. In fact, it is a critique of the self-directed life itself. And it's a critique that is not so easy to answer. <coughs> So let me say a word about American foreign policy. I was in a debate um, with a professor not very long ago, and he said to me, isn't it the case that America in the Middle East is only involved, or primarily involved, for reasons of oil? In other words, isn't oil the reason that we are over there? And I said to him, sir, I certainly hope so. I can't think of any other reasons to be over there, can you? Now, what are we getting at here? What we're getting at here is the question of, is it legitimate for a country to pursue its own self-interest in foreign policy? The hidden assumption of the critics is that it's not. America should not pursue its own self-interest in foreign policy. America should pursue, presumably, other people's interests, or some universal interest. And I want to suggest that that point of view is deeply undemocratic, and is in fact based on a complete misunderstanding of what foreign policy is. Foreign policy is not philanthropy. In a democratic society, we elect leaders to look out for us. Why do you think the unions are voting for President Obama? To look out for management? No, they are voting their own interests. That's the meaning of democracy. So to me, there is nothing illegitimate. In fact, it would be deeply illegitimate for a country to ignore its self-interest in pursuing a foreign policy. Now, America is a superpower. So it is reasonable to say, hey, America, Unlike other countries, you have a very big footprint in the world. In doing all this stuff, in Iraq, in Afghanistan, are you making the world better? Or are you making the world worse? That's a fair question. In pursuing your interests, how are you leaving the planet? And I want to take that question on head on. And I want to argue uh, that in the last five years, 10 years, 20 years, 50 years, 75 years, in my opinion, on the balance, American foreign policy has made the world one heck of a lot better. Now, let's go back in history for a moment. World War II. By the way, America only got into World War II for reasons of self-interest. It was not the gas chambers, it was not Dachau, it was only when the Japanese attacked at Pearl Harbor that America got in the war. So America got in for self-interest, and yet, left the world vastly better 
with the smashing of Japanese imperialism and the Nazi regime in Germany, the Cold War. America got in it for self-interest, again. And yet, at the end of it, the world was much freer. Not without problems, by the way. Look at the instability in Russia. But yet nobody in Russia says, let's bring back the old Soviet regime. Why? Because there's an understanding that with all the chaos, Russia is better off, the world is better off, without the Cold War. Afghanistan. America got into Afghanistan after 9-11 for reasons of self-interest, to smash the Taliban training camps. And yet, today, hey, there's a lot of problems in Afghanistan, but Afghanistan is better than it was under Taliban rule. Better, by the way, does not mean perfect. The other day I was watching CNN, and I see some sort of a retired military analyst. He goes, they still grow puppies in Afghanistan. You've got warlords running around over there. And then he said this, we've taken Afghanistan from the 11th century and left it in the 14th century. Now I'm thinking, well, that's progress. <laughs> in other words, foreign policy is about improvement. It's not about utopianism. We're not going to try to take Kabul and make it into Cleveland, if we would even want to do that. <laughs> uh, but that's not possible. You're trying to make things better, not perfect. And by the way, that's true, I believe, even in Iraq. It's been expensive, it's been difficult. If we had to do it again, would I do it? No. But, <coughs> nevertheless, I think it's inarguable. You know, here we are going into Libya, and the rationale is, we've got to save some civilian lives because they are in jeopardy from this uh, desert nomad Qaddafi. Well, yes, but can we remember the 300,000 Iraqis in the mass graves put there by Saddam Hussein? Aren't we better off having, not having that going on in Iraq? So my point is this. America is always accused of being this and doing that. But the truth of it is America acts very differently as far as I can see from any previous empire in world history. Everyone says America is an empire. They say, America's invaded all these countries. We invaded Grenada, we invaded Libya, we invaded Iraq, we invaded Afghanistan. And I say, well, if we invaded all those countries, how come we don't own them? How come we went in and somehow got out? How come we gave the countries back? How come the Bush administration said to the Iraqi people, we like this guy, Iyad Alawi, we vote for him. The Iraqis go, no thank you, we'll vote for the religious guy. Jafari, now the current Prime Minister, Maliki. And America goes, okay, that's your man. Point being here <coughs> that this is unusual behavior for a superpower. I remember right after 9-11, I was watching on CNN. American planes are hitting military targets in Kabul and dropping rations of food for civilians on the enemy side. I'm thinking, hmm, what empire does this? I mean, can you think of like Genghis Khan storming across the plains of Central Asia? You know, would he be handing out bowls of Mongolian beef? <laughs> no. This is American exceptionalism in foreign policy. America doing stuff that would never occur to anybody else to do. And so whenever someone says, look at America and its influence on the world, I always say, what would the world be like if there wasn't America? What, what would the world be like if America's power was currently enjoyed by, say, Russia or China? Because the truth of the matter is, if we aren't number one, somebody else is going to be. They're going to have power, and they're going to use it. And I think we can be very grateful for the way in which America uses its power. If you look at our foreign policy, it's based on two principles. What's the first principle? Trade with us and don't bomb us. That's kind of it. That's the first principle. Pretty benign. Trade with us and don't bomb us. Here's the second principle, I think equally defensible. It's called the principle of the lesser evil. 
And that means that in foreign policy, you are allowed to ally with the bad guy to get rid of the worst guy. Now this is very important because very often when you go to the political science seminar, they're choosing between the good guy and the bad guy. But not in the real world, where you're often choosing between the bad guy and the really bad guy. And then sometimes you've got to make a pact with the lesser evil to get rid of the greater evil. When you don't do that, big problems. Wow, it's turning out to be kind of windy tonight. I'm going to wrap it up. Uh, in the 1970s, Jimmy Carter, I want to be the president of human rights. Oh, Mr. Carter, we want to bring to your attention that America is allied with the Shah of Iran, a bad guy. He has a secret police. Jimmy Carter, well, this will not do. If I want to be dedicated to human rights, we've got to pull the Persian rug out from under that guy. And so America assists in the uh, abdication of the Shah. We get rid of the bad guy. And who do we get? Khomeini. The Khomeini revolution began, and Islamic radicalism traces itself to that moment. Without Khomeini, we would not have been lauded. So it was the bungling of American foreign policy that, in part, sowed the seeds of all this. Let me turn very briefly to my closing theme. The radical Muslims. If you read their literature, you discover that they do have critiques of our foreign policy. But their deepest critique is not that. Uh, their leading thinkers don't talk about that. In fact, one of them, the Egyptian thinker Saeed Qutb, who's been called sort of the, the Marx, if you will, of radical Islam, barely mentions American foreign policy. So what's, what's their argument? What are they saying to guys on the Muslim street? I want to put it in that sort of, uh, in its highest form. Because very often if you go to the 4th of July picnic, uh, or the um, American um, celebrations, you will have American leaders, say Republican and Democrat, America is great because America is prosperous. Uh, America is free. America extends rights to women. Uh, America is diverse. America offers religious liberty. Now, the smartest of the radical Muslims know all this. In fact, they can see it. Their point is, yeah, we agree that America's all this, but who cares? That's not the most important thing for a country to do, to be. Their argument is that American society is based on one principle, liberty, freedom. And they say that Islamic society is based on a different principle, and a better, a higher principle. Not freedom, not liberty, but virtue. Their argument is that freedom is a very defective political idea. Why? Because freedom can be used well, or freedom can be used badly. In fact, Saeed Qutb quotes the philosopher Immanuel Kant, who says, out of the crooked timber of humanity, no straight thing was ever made. His point being a very Christian point, human nature is a little bent, it's a little warped. And given that human nature is that way, you can fully expect that freedom would often be used badly. And Kutub's point is, if you want proof, kind of look around in America. So he says, in Islamic society, we're not aspiring to freedom. We don't care about it. We aspire to virtue. We're trying to do the will of God. We might be poor, but that is our objective. Now, we might be failing, but at least we're trying. And that makes us morally superior to you because virtue is a higher principle than freedom. Now, I want to, as I close and open the door to questions, leave you with my way of thinking about and answering this argument, which is for me a tricky argument because I think it's premise that virtue is not only A, but B central goal of society. I think this premise is absolutely true. I agree with it 100%. In fact, I would even agree that in the sort of Platonic empire, in the great hierarchy of values, that virtue is in fact a more important value than freedom. I agree with that also. 
But where I think the Islamic <coughs> radicals, the critics go wrong, what they ignore, what they miss, is that freedom is the necessary prerequisite for virtue. Or to put it somewhat differently, without freedom, how can you have virtue at all? If you imagine the case of the woman who in, uh, is required in Iran or in Afghanistan to wear the, the hijab, the veil, ask yourself this question. Is that woman really modest? My answer is no. She's not. Why? Because she's being forced. She's required to do it. It's only if you can choose freely that you can choose what is good. So, here's my point. If the supply of virtue is insufficient in the free society, which it is, it is nevertheless non-existent in the authoritarian or in the theocratic society. Why? Because an imposed or coerced virtue is ultimately no virtue at all. A long time ago, Edmund Burke said, to love our country, our country should be lovely. What does he mean? True patriotism is not, hey, my country is great, love it or leave it. Don't like it, get out of here. The highest form of patriotism, Burke is saying, is to love your country, not just because it is yours, uh, but also because it is good. And what I've been trying to suggest tonight in a small way is that I think America, this is a question you should ask for yourself, does America meet this Burkean test? Is it worthy of our highest allegiance? And I think at the end of the day it is. Not just because it makes possible for us the good life, which so many of us enjoy, but also because it makes available to us, if we will choose it, the life that is good. Thank you very much. Thank you. Virtue is a function of motive 
or intention. So Jesus says, if you have contemplated the sin, in effect, you've committed it. How's that possible? I didn't do it, but I thought about it. My intention defines morality. By and large, if you go to a Muslim cleric and say, you know, that woman who's wearing the veil, uh, she's actually not very modest at all. He's going to say, who cares? She's wearing the veil. He doesn't care what her inner self is. He cares about whether she's following the rules. So if you look at ancient Judaism and you look at Islam, they're similar. They're religions of law and practice. Christianity looks much more at the inner life and the motives of why you do something. And that is seen as just as important as the consequences of what you do. I think a broader and, to my view, deeper understanding of morality. Okay, other thoughts or questions? Yes. stuff 
that the rest of the world wants to buy, you are invincible. No rich country can compete with you. You are on your way up and they are on their way down. Why? Because you're producing the same stuff for $5 a day that's costing them $15 to $25 an hour. How are they going to win that game? It's a done deal. So here's my point. In the last 25 years, hundreds of millions of people in countries like Brazil, Indonesia, India, and China have climbed out of poverty. How have they done it? Because of the privilege of backwardness. So globalization, a creation of America, is the greatest anti-poverty program ever devised. No amount of transfer programs, no amount of government loans, no amount of philanthropy, including the philanthropy of Mother Teresa, has done one iota to improve the prospects of the world's poor compared to global capitalism. So that's the ultimate answer to this question. It is that ultimately, America has created the framework in which all these poor people can now come up. By the way, if any other country had power, it would be using it to block the privilege of backwardness. It would be using it to seal the American economy. It would be using it to shut down the, um, the relative gains of economic power occurring in the rest of the world. America's doing nothing about it. And this too is American exceptionalism. Okay, uh, yes. I am. Um, uh, so if you understand the basic thesis of the book, sure. there's a little exploitation of free market capitalism, globalization, and democracy breeds ethnic hatred and violence. How would you address that concept? Well, <laughs> here's the problem. Um, by the way, Amy Chu is in the, in the news lately for the superiority of the Chinese Hmong uh, thesis. Um, and she's very provocative, a Yale Law professor. Um, and uh, to some degree, I think what she's saying is right, which is what? Um, that as the world globalizes, there you have a transmutation of hatreds. Just as, for example, if you were growing up in a small village, you can say, my village is the greatest, the next village are the enemy, right? But after a while, when you're a member of a state, let's say California, uh, or Alabama, you go, Alabamans are the greatest. Uh, uh, people from Mississippi suck. Uh, and then later you can say, Americans are the greatest. Uh, people from other countries stink. And so you, what's happening here, your radius of loyalty is being transferred. It's not like you're becoming a better or worse person. Just the circumference of attachment is shifting. Here's the point. People will say about capitalism. Capitalism is based on greed. Capitalism is based on greed? No. The greed is not in capitalism. The greed is in human nature. The ingenuity of capitalism is to figure out a way to take that aspect of human nature and make it work for the benefit of society. So I've written one of my essays, um, Capitalism Civilizes Greed in the Same Way That Marriage Civilizes Lust. So here's lust. It's part of human nature, too. You can try to root it out, pretty unlikely. So what do you do? You find ways and institutions to channel it, to mutual love, the raising of children. That's the point. So similarly, this tribalism is part of human nature. So Amy Chua's point is simply to diagnose the movement of the tribal feeling from the ethnic group to the national group and so on. That's true. But it, it, it doesn't mean that, it, it's not an indictment of globalization. It simply means that solving one problem often creates new problems that you then have to solve separately. Okay? Other questions or thoughts? Yes, sir. We talk about the difference in wages between these countries. Don't we have these high wages because we're stupid enough to inflate our money supply? Let's think about this for a moment. Uh, do we have these high wages because we're, we've been inflating the uh, money supply? I think this is it. Uh, America had a kind of, you might say, precious moment for about 30 years between, uh, between the end of World War II and the mid-70s. And 
here's how I would describe this precious moment. In general, for any country, uh, the hardworking, the brilliant, the creative, the successful, those are the guys who are rewarded in society, and they're going to do really well. Not counting the old aristocratic classes that are already encrusted, but that's how you get mobility. By and large, what to me was amazing about America when I came to America in the 70s, and this had been true for 30 years, you didn't have to be any of those things to have a really good life. You could be a really ordinary guy, not even care about work, study, you could be kind of lazy, and nevertheless, you'd be assured I'll have a pretty good job, and I'll have two cars, uh, and if I live in California, I might have a pool in my backyard. Um, this American life was available even to the loser. It was available democratically. Uh, I think that if, if there's one thing that's changing in America very fast, is that that's no longer true. Uh, Tom Friedman, actually, of the New York Times put it pretty well. He said, when I was growing up, he says, my parents told me, eat your food because there are millions of starving people in India. He goes, now I tell my kids, you better work hard because there are millions of Indians waiting to take your job. So, in a nutshell, now I think the other factor though, I have, I'm be candid about it, I do think that there is a huge downward drive on productivity produced by unions. Uh, I'm not even going to talk about public sector unions, but here's the point. I mean, <laughs> Detroit is, has had a hard time competing, not just with Korea and China, it has a hard time competing with Toyota in North Carolina. Because Detroit wages are $25 to $30 an hour, and in North Carolina they're about more like $19. So even within America, you have, so you have to ask, what's the difference? The difference is organized pressure for wages, for health care. So the company exceeds. Okay, we'll give it to you. But obviously we've got to put the cost into the car. So the bottom line of it is, everybody is being dragged down by this downward. And the truth of it is, in a globalized world, you can't hide from that. Somebody is going to beat you if your costs are higher. So the solution, in a way, of the left is impractical. It's go to these other countries and beat them up and try to force them to have unions. Try to force them to push their wages up so our guys can then compete. I think this is going absolutely nowhere. Uh, the Chinese, the Indians, the Brazilians have no interest in going down this road. Uh, and so here is Obama trying to saddle them with environmental regulations, labor laws. Hey, by the way, take all this stuff that we have for you. It will help to raise your prices. This way you won't be able to compete so successfully against us. They're not stupid. They're like, thank you, um, but no thank you. So that's where we are now. Um, very interesting moment in, in, in global negotiations. No, the issue here is not inflation. Inflation, we haven't had, see, we had runaway inflation in the 70s. We have not had serious inflation. In fact, China and India have more inflation than we do. Brazil has much more inflation than we do. Inflation right now is not our main problem. It is true that our huge deficit, you know, here we are running a $15 trillion deficit. We're adding $1.5 trillion every year. And we're a rich country. You know, we can afford to do a lot of stuff. But for the first time, I think, as someone who looks at this kind of stuff, we are putting the security of the boat in jeopardy. That is not good. Uh, and so, the inflation I worry about is the inflation when the United States has debt that it cannot pay. And it will pay by printing money. And then we will have third world inflation, while the third world has first world inflation. So a switching of sides. They have no inflation and our dollar loses a third of its value every year. That would be very scary. Uh, what's happening? <laughs> well, some of us are trying to prevent it. <laughs> but yes, uh, we have been heading down that road a little bit. Yes. Um, in America, we've 
focus a lot on freedom, and rightly so. As I said earlier, self-directed life, that's a core idea of America. <clears throat> but ultimately, a country is not judged, nor does it succeed, based on freedom. A country succeeds based on how it uses its freedom. That is the key question. And interestingly, while we debate freedom, we never ask, how are we using our freedom? Uh, we spent all this time in court cases and so on, um, uh, protecting freedom at its outer limits. And but the founders, by the way, were very concerned about uh, teaching people how to use freedom well. Now, the founders believed that that was not the job of the federal government, that there were intermediate institutions between the individual and the state. The family, the church, the little league, the Boy Scouts, this, these are the, you might say, incubators of virtue in a free society. It's their job to show young people, yes, but even old people, uh, how freedom is best used. And, 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 and the president's job, by the way, is to be a kind of exemplar of that idea, to articulate it, to defend it. And uh, so, uh, to me, uh, America's biggest problem is this. We have, in a sense, allowed those institutions to erode, to weaken, uh, and yet they are the absolute key to our success. Uh, if I could sum it up, I would say the problem for me, as an outsider, is <laughs> there are certain qualities of American exceptionalism that made us strong, and we are undermining those very qualities in America now. So, a, a revival or rediscovery of what our strength really is, is key to, for us to maintain that strength. Otherwise, I think that strength is going to, is going to erode. So that to me is, is a cause for hope because it means that we can turn it around. There's great vitality in America, but it's also a cause for pause because it's not gonna be easy. Uh, and it's not simply a matter of who's in the Oval Office. It's a much bigger issue than that. Uh, time for one last question. <coughs> yes. Well, Khomeini, he was, he was not somewhat at fault, he was largely at fault. Right, so wasn't it the administration that you worked for that then sold Khomeini Tomahawk missiles? I mean, how, how would you justify that in foreign policy? The principle of the lesser evil. Uh, in other words, in other words, um, Reagan did not help Khomeini come to power. Khomeini was already in power. Right? And there was in the 1980s an eight year Iran Iraq war, which was a massively bloody war on both sides, with shifting momentum. Um, what was America's interest in that situation with that war? It was a war, by, by the way, between two uh, wonderful uh, characters Khomeini on the one side and Saddam Hussein on the other. Uh, so two paragons of virtue, kind of going at it. Um, and you can see our interest in this, in this war, which is, is essentially entertainment. No, I'm kidding. Our interest in the war is essentially uh, not to help either side. Uh, now, excuse me, this whole business of, of uh, selling arms to Iran, by the way, a big mistake, and acknowledged to be a mistake, that's what the Iran-Contra scandal was all about. Um, why did Reagan do something so stupid? Uh, and the bottom line is because there were American hostages being held in Iran. Uh, and the uh, Iranians told the CIA, if you sell us some weapons to fight this war with Saddam Hussein, we'll let the hostages go. Um, one of them, had, by the way, a guy named Buckley had been tortured, another guy had been thrown off a ship. Bottom line of it is Reagan uh, sort of went soft on us, and by that I mean in a humanitarian way, he sort of thought, I can get these Americans back home, this is a war that doesn't directly involve us. It was a mistake, uh, but it was a mistake that we can understand how it happened, and it did not have the catastrophic consequences uh, of the earlier mistake, which was, in, in removing an authoritarian dictator, we got a totalitarian regime that has been, for 30 years, a thorn in our side. Um, you know, think about it, before Khomeini, no one said, America is the great Satan. 
Before Khomeini, no one said America, no leader said America is the center of evil in the world. All Muslims who believe in God should be willing to go to their death, martyrdom, against these evil, satanic Americans. This is a new language. Khomeini invented it on the world stage. So here's the, I'll leave you maybe with this uh, thought <coughs> that as an immigrant, when I look at America, I'm always asking, compared to what? It's a question Americans almost never ask. Uh, but a few years ago, I was debating Jesse Jackson. We're talking about is America a racist society? Actually, during this debate, um, I was kind of amazed because I, you know, sometimes you kind of go into a reverie. And I was watching this debate, and there was Jackson kind of doing his thing, you know, playing with his mustache. You know, I may be well dressed, but I'm still oppressed and stuff. But he's kind of doing his thing. I was kind of watching him, and I'm saying to myself, you know, that guy and I are the same skin color, but we see America so differently. Why is that? Mm -hmm. And it, it, as I thought about it, it hit me, we're using a different reference point. I, as an immigrant, I'm always comparing America to some other country, because I grew up in a different country. So I'm comparing America to some existing country, but that's not what Jesse Jackson's doing. He's not saying America stinks compared to Rwanda or Kenya. What is he saying? America falls short compared to what? He's using a utopian standard, the Garden of Eden. He's comparing America to its own ideals. And obviously compared to that standard of perfection, yeah, America falls short, I guess. So in judging your own country, Weirdly, by using this utopian standard, you are secretly testifying to America's moral superiority. Because you don't judge any other country that way. You judge other countries by a comparative standard. Well, yeah, the Tibetans killed 5,000 people, but the Chinese last year killed 50,000. No big deal. That's called the comparative standard. But America, oh, seven guys were unjustly arrested. The president should be impeached. America's being compared to a standard no other country would even think of using. So ironically, it's the left that is, has a hidden assumption of American moral superiority in doing this. Bottom line is I've raised a lot of issues tonight, and my goal here is not to assert things or even persuade you of everything, but rather to stimulate you to think critically uh, and don't uh, give in to a reflexive anti-Americanism that tends to blame your, your own country when by any comparative or objective standard, America would not justify that kind of savage attack. Ultimately, as an immigrant, I want to urge you to learn to love your country. Thank you very much. finished, I looked at my remarks and saw a comment made by Phil Lindau. Thoughtful evaluation of competing worldviews is a critical component of a liberal arts education, leading students and those involved in campus life to assess the values of ideas based on merit rather than on a prevailing public I want to thank the Lindau family for what they have done in offering us this opportunity. I hope you have had an opportunity to spark some ideas in your mind that you might be able to take to a class discussion or to an opportunity to visit with friends and talk through, to think about what it means to you. We're not here to answer all the questions or to provide or prescribe. We're here to give you a chance to dig deep, to find for yourself things that make a difference in your life. That's a Gustavus education. That's what we offer at this institution, and I see the students here so engaged in this discussion, and I thank you, Dr. D'Souza, for, for bringing this opportunity for them to think about issues they haven't. I want to call your attention to the fact that on April 12th, uh, next year, the Lindau Symposium Lecture will be given by Charles Krauthammer. 
What a wonderful opportunity. Uh, it will be during our sesquicentennial celebration. And the Lindows have offered to provide the resources for that lectureship here. And I invite you to think about coming back. Again, Dr. D'Souza, thank you very much for your remarks today. I hope you have piqued some thinking in these young men and women and all of us who are of any age to think about things that are uh, thoughtful and, and give us an opportunity to think about issues of today that we're facing as a wonderful country, a country that means so much to all of us. We're going to join together in the lower level for a reception. You'll have an opportunity to talk to Dr. D'Souza and also to the Lindau family. Uh, we really appreciate you being here. Thank you for being part of this special evening.